Thank you all for staying. Appreciate that. Um, just so I can get a sense of the audience, uh, how many are familiar with performance contracting? Okay, good. And how many have either worked for a town or live in a town where their town has done performance contracting? And were any of those through the state process? Down to one. All right, I got it. All right, good. So. My background is quickly that I did this not on the state process in another town, then I went to Enfield and did it through the state process. Um, both have been successful, and the reason why we chose the state process through Enfield was because the state already did the RFQ, so all we needed to do was pick a firm. So it was a lot easier to do it versus going through the whole process of trying to figure out who was qualified first, uh, and then um, going through the RFP process, so we went straight to the RFP, which helped a lot. Clicker, all right. So I'll briefly do this since the majority of people already understand what it is, but it is a project where the money that you spend on the project is paid back through the savings of the project itself. So it's a self-funding program. In many ways, uh, you can take care of a lot of capital projects in this format. Uh, so it's a great way to save taxpayer dollars because you're, you're using, again, the money that you saved uh, to pay for it. And um, it affects the budget only through that way in which you are going to cap, and I'll just use the next slide, you are going to cap what you're currently spending in energy that next year after you've initiated performance contracting, you either save or only pay up to the amount that you were recently paying on utility bills. So that's how you can say to your residents that you will not be spending anymore or you will not be adding taxes uh, to them to uh, accomplish this type of project. So just a brief, uh, brief background with Enfield. In 2013, the state is, is when they issued their RFQ to the ESCOs, the energy saving companies. A lot of acronyms in uh, this space, so if you know them all already, then I can quickly go through it. If not, I'll sell them all out. Um, in 2014, uh, early last year is when we sent the letters of interest. I linked to them. If you guys are interested, I can show them. Not, I'll, you know, they're in the PowerPoint for when you view them, uh, when you go home tonight and you're still interested in everything that we're talking about today. Um, but I have, just to make it easier for everybody here, I did link to what the letter of interest is, what the technical facility profile is, what the RFP is that the state is requesting, so you have that resource. But ultimately, this, the, the ESCOs that you're interested in working with would like a let, we send them a letter of interest to say, if you are interested in working with us, send, sign this, send this back. Uh, we will provide you with a ton of our data from all our facilities so that you can get a better understanding of how you're going to work with us and the types of uh, responsibilities that you'll have in going through your IGEA, uh, your preliminary site assessment. And then ultimately after that, when we sent, we got our letters of interest back, surprisingly, they all wanted the work. Um, so that was good. And so then at that point, we issued our RFQ to the ESCOs and we did interviews which uh, will be next, but the most important thing, and I'll say this time and time again, is we had a great technical service provider uh, or third-party administrator who the town worked with, and that is very key and critical because we are not the experts in this field, and there are people that you can hire um, to work with you that will ask the tough questions, ask the industry questions, ask the knowledgeable questions, that will sit with you in those meetings or wherever or however or however much you use them. And in Enfield's case, they have been so invaluable that they've saved us millions of dollars on a project that will be millions of dollars, but they've, they've scaled down the scope to what we actually truly needed and wanted. And, and that's something that we wouldn't have known without them there. And that speaks large volumes on them, and I don't think that's a criticism on us. It just goes to show that uh, there are people that are knowledgeable in the space and use them, and it's, it's a good practice. So we conducted the interviews with the TSP because they were able to ask those questions that we wouldn't have thought of to get the, the ingrained questions uh, or answers that would have helped us know which was the best for us. 
uh, we selected our ESCO, and, we, and, they, and that spent the majority of the summer and fall going through their IGEA. Everybody knows it's a very long and arduous process. They go into every single building. Uh, they're using the, all their engineers and contractors to make sure that they have a full understanding of what all the mechanicals are in every building, uh, what the usage is in every building, uh, are people in rooms when the lights are on, and when they leave the rooms, do the lights turn off, do they just stay on 24 hours a day? Uh, do you have that teacher who likes to crank up the heat in one room and another teacher who likes to crank down the heat in one room so you're getting massive changes in energy usage uh, throughout your facilities or through in different facilities? So they collect all that data and they come back and say, this is the type of project that we think would be good for you. And then that's part, sort of the preliminary site assessment. From there, we worked all together, all three of us, the ESCO, myself, and the TSP, where we, we really went through the scope of the project. And that's where the TSP was huge, because they were able to get us to realize, uh, rightfully, that just because a project is uh, an energy saving measure that might sound great, the payback was way longer than what we were comfortable in part of a payback uh, plan that we had. And so not all the time is an energy saving measure just because it saves energy worth it. And so it really scaled down the project to something where the majority, if not all the projects, had a payback period that were at or below what we wanted. Uh, and that really got us to two options, which I'll show you that we presented. But all together, we developed the scope. We had a clear understanding of the timeline. And I will go back to that, because that's how the town of Enfield was successful with the state program. Uh, an agreement on all the MV protocols, MV, measurement and verification, just for the, I think, two people that don't know what <laughs> performance contracting is. Uh, understanding of all the markups, that's huge. Uh, all the ESCOs clearly have large markups because they're offering a service that, other, if you were to do it yourself, it would cost a, a lot more money and a lot more time. So they have the markups, you got to live with that, but you can still negotiate that part. Uh, up to a point because a lot of those markups have been predetermined with their, with their contract with the state when they would, did their RFQ. Uh, financing workshops was important with staff, with me, with the town manager, the finance director, and more, most importantly, the council, so they understood how these types of projects can be financed. They submitted the pre preliminary IGEA, Investment Grade Energy Audit, and the review and approval of the IGEA from the town, uh, and that's where I accidentally forgot to put the TSP. Our TSP was Peregrine, now that you know that. Um, so that was a misstep by me. Uh, and then another financing workshop and, uh, and financing uh, a bid. So this goes to show the depth of which we did this project. It wasn't one of those projects where we figured we'd find one, two buildings, see if it works. We already did that because in 2008, the town of Enfield tried to do a performance contract with another ESCO and it failed at referendum. So I asked the council if I could do it again and they basically said, Sure, uh, good luck. And so uh, I said, all right, let's do this. Uh, you know, we're really gonna make this work. Um, we did almost every single building. The only reason why we didn't do these four buildings on the bottom right is because the water pollution control facility is currently under review and project to redo the entire thing. So that's doing it on its own. The two high schools, one is we don't know what we're doing with it because we're consolidating the two and they're all going to Enfield High, all the students and teachers and athletics, so Enfield High School is also under complete reconstruction right now. Uh, so that is hopefully being as energy efficient as possible when it's built. The nice thing is that building's gonna be solar ready when it's built. So although the panels aren't gonna be on the building at installation, at any time that the community decides that that's a decision it wants to make, it's already hooked up for all the electrical to go up. So that's how that is, and the old town hall is just a building at this point. This is the laundry list of energy saving measures that any community could have an ESCO look at. Um, so you can imagine how a project can get gigantic and you need yourself and your TSP to help scale it down so that you're at a point where you have a project that's the right fit for your community. Ultimately, you, you, know, you get some of the things, the lighting and lighting controls, that's ultimately what's gonna pay for the majority of the other ESMs because that's the quick, easy, and the, the money driver. Uh, but it's the lighting and lighting controls that are gonna play for a lot of the 
uh, boilers and uh, you know, some of the other major, more uh, mechanical, heavy capital projects. But every single one of these are ones that RSCO looked at. So you can see how they really go through everything and look at everything to find the best options for that com uh, community. So this is a slide that I actually presented to our council because I wanted them to truly have an understanding of what they were getting into and the questions that they should be thinking about um, from an objective point of view to make sure that is this right for the town and is the project that you're selecting right for the town. What projects lend themselves to performance contracting? And the question I'm asking there is should you do the lighting to pay for boilers, things that are on your capital improvement plan, or should you also take care of that walk-in freezer cooler control, which doesn't cost much, but its payback period because of its energy conservation is 60, 70, 80 years. So it's a small little thing, but the payback period's huge. So it doesn't really have an effect on the overall budget, but people might get caught up on the payback period. So you start to, you start to see the, how these ESMs and the cost and the payback period might play. So what projects within them lend themselves to it? What is the payback period you're comfortable with? Most are 15 to 20 years, so which one is right for your community? Does a simple payback of an ESM fit inside the desired payback period? So as like I was saying before, if there's a ESM that has a payback period of 30 to 40 years, but you're trying to strive for a payback period or a, you know, a financing of 15 to 20 years, does it make sense to stay in there? Or is that something you can take care of on maybe a phase two or on your own? Um, what was not included in the recommended project scope? What are we choosing to leave out? You know, are we making sure that we're doing the things that are going to be hard hitting, quick, make sure we're saving a bunch of energy right out of the gate so, and so that we could potentially use that for a future project or we're just saying this is not the right time to do that sort of project. Can we include other capital projects in the total? So if you are realizing great gains in energy savings, can you throw in other capital projects that stay within the amount that you're going to save in that year? And I'll get to an example that we were going to do in Enfield, uh, an option, that was a major capital improvement that would have cost taxpayers a good amount of money, but it would have stayed within the savings that we had. So are there capital projects that can stay within that? And then, uh, well, I'm sort of answered that on the bottom line. So we got a nice little you know, uh, matrix of what we're doing on the top. I don't expect you to read them, but those are all our buildings. On the bottom are the energy saving measures, the ESMs that we decided we were going to go with. And you can see how different ones affect different buildings. And so it just goes to show that some things are going to go throughout the community, and other things are sort of cherry picked for the right building, that right ESM for that. So for example, our library was, I think, the only one that's getting a full redone HVAC system. Uh, and then that's going to be changed from uh, oil heat to gas heat. So, and, but no other building had that. So I mean, it just goes to show that you, you find the opportunities within your community. So we developed four projects because we wanted to make sure our council had the opinion. We wanted to make sure the council made the decision. So we said, do you want, there's two projects that are straight energy saving projects. We do these and you're just going to get your biggest bang for your buck. Or would you like to add in a major capital project as well? So, and the reason why that was interesting is because we're also doing a major facilities assessment program, which then, you know, that would be the one project on the referendum this fall that doesn't pay for itself. Um, so did we want to take some of that money off of that referendum and put it into this one because this one ultimately pays for itself? And then so we had two different, one, two different types of projects um, that the, the council could look at, but the one, and, and obviously they'll go with one. And I'm going to quickly go through these because I know, I know you guys all love to know what's going on in Enfield, but I'll quickly go through just to get you to, to see how we approach this. Option one was, you know, soup to nuts, the, the, the basics. This is what you would get in general for us, what we developed as our scope. I don't expect you to read the numbers, but there's a better slide at the end with the numbers. Ultimately, um, this was what we assumed was our base option. Option two, though, because the cost at the time said that all the lighting should just stay T8 except for one building where it just so happened that the savings actually was better off if we went LED. So there was one building that was going to be LED and the rest were T8s. 
Option two was, all right, we'll just go LED with every building. I'll get to all this stuff in a minute. Option three says, so option one and option two were the energy saving programs. Option three and option four were the capital project where we could take our worst building, it's one of our schools and it's one of the, it pretty much has the original everything in it and it was built in the 60s. And so you could pretty much put your finger through the wall where all the windows are and if you touch the window, the window might actually break and fall and you know, hurt everybody. So you, know, you couldn't really move in the school. Um, so we knew this was going to be one of the things that we put on our facilities plan, but hey, here's an option. We could take care of this as part of energy performance contracting. Believe it or not, as you know, the roofs and windows aren't huge energy saving measures, uh, but it's part of the whole package. We're going to talk about envelope and other things that happen with uh, ra radiant heat and some other things. So we said, hey, why don't we change the way that the school's heated? So at, we're all doing all new rooftop units. And since we're doing all new rooftop units, let's just replace the roof while we're at it. And let's fix those windows that are paper thin. So that actually changed the payback period for the first two options was 15 years. This is now a 20 year payback. And we still were able to get in where we could save money at the end of the day. Well, this one actually was just over budget, but this one, so we said, all right, well, let's just back out the windows, option four, and now we'll save. So in summary of those, you know, option one, two, three, four, costs, obviously it goes up significantly when you're talking about adding capital projects, but the rebates kicked up, the net cost uh, went up a little bit, the savings jacked up, the O&M savings went up, and so overall, they still all worked out together and I'll, I'll, I'll summarize those in a second. But what are different ways that you could finance? I mean, I wanted to make sure I touched everything for a second. Uh, there's, you could lease finance, you could bond it. Um, I'm sure most, I get, that's all dependent on interest rates and which one makes best, most uh, sense for your community. Right now, lease financing is, is a good one. You do whatever you want, obviously. Uh, but bond, bond rates are low right now, so it's, a, it's, an, it's an option. The benefit of going through uh, the, state con the state process uh, and the ESCO we, provide, uh, we went with had some other financing benefits like a pure rate buy down. So for I think the first 10 years you get a 1% rate reduction on your interest on your financing. So that's a savings. 0% um, financing for $500,000, basically getting a free $500,000. I mean, ultimately you got to pay that back but there's no interest on it. And then you, they, they go out to bid, so you make sure you get the best. And then when looking at the payoff, this is something that I thought was interesting and, and necessary was the project, so if you're talking about a 15-year project, when you're revising your ESMs to figure out which is the best project for your community, the first chunk of that is going to be the project payoff, but you still have to take into account the payoff of the financing. So in Enfield, for example, we have a 15-year payoff. Thir it's going to take 13 and a half years to pay off the project, but it's still another year and a half just to pay off the financing. That gets you to your 15-year, and it's similar with the 20. So when you're thinking about the financing and the payoff period, you've got to include the financing with the project cost. Other things to consider when you're talking about financing were the, uh, do, are you looking for a short payoff, or does your community not mine a long-term project? Um, would you, do you want money back in your pocket? Otherwise, uh, you know, in other words, saying right now Enfield spends $4 million in utilities. So, uh, you know, next year we're still going to budget $4 million and the chunk is going to pay for the, the lease financing. But there's a chunk, you go back to that slide, the second slide, you had that green mark on the front. Three out of those four options had a chunk left over that we would not have to spend anymore. So while we were doing a great upgrade to a lot of our capital and our energy usage, we were still making, quote unquote, making money on the end. It's ultimately we're just not spending it. Uh, so that's a way to look at that. Are you looking for a biggest bang for your buck? Is that the just straight energy program or are you, or are you doing something that you want some uh, capital in there? Uh, that being the deferred eliminated capital costs, and are you looking for any debt avoidance? That's putting things on the performance contracting that otherwise would have been on your CIP, and those things obviously affect your mill rate and how you budget and stuff, whereas this, you're taking care of it within a self-contained self-financing program. Quickly, project one at the bottom saved us 
an extra $57,000 at the end of the year. Some of these numbers have been revised since because they, the ESCO went out to bid and got act their actual numbers. These were based on their estimated numbers. So we would have made or saved an additional almost $900,000 after 15 years. Option two, upgrading to LED, we saved $35,000 a year, ultimately $500,000 after 15 years. Option three was the one where we actually would have to spend on top of what we're currently spending each year on utilities, but you knew the project that we got involved in too. Uh, so that we would actually have to spend an extra million dollars after 20 years. And then, but you take out the windows and we save 25 grand a year for a little bit more. So what if the town didn't do uh, performance contract and we said, you know what, let's just decide we're gonna do this all in one year and we're gonna make the taxpayers pay for it. Well, we're talking three to five and a half mil rate increase just to do the projects that ultimately pay for themselves over a 15 year period. So that's how, that's the effect, the financial effect that something like this could have with the assumption, obviously you wouldn't do it all in a year, but it makes the point that if you were to choose to do it yourself all in one year without the markups, without the ESCO help, you are substantially putting a, a greater burden on your community when you don't have to. So we, in, in our community, we really had to get involved. We had to tell council, we had to do finance workshop, regular council meeting, public hearings, as is typical because you need to get on a referendum and set a public hearing date. So this is the slide that I wanted to make sure that everybody saw. So because this is the one thing that I figured would be the best sort of go away with. We were successful with the state program um, because myself um, and others were committed to the project and committed to getting it done. Um, there, wasn't a mess, there wasn't a thing where we just thought it was a decent idea, so let's just play it out. We already knew it worked. We wanted to make sure it just happened. Um, we had a very, and have, a very good relationship with the ESCO. Uh, we talk weekly, sometimes daily. Um, I have a very good relationship with all the members of the ESCO team. They all call me, they all email me, hey, what's going on, especially when we're talking about our TSP. Sometimes I, that's my, you know, attack dog. I'm the nice guy, so it helps out very well. Um, I have a very good relationship with the TSP. It's a, it's a cordial relationship between the ESCO and the TSP. Um, but that's very important that the TSP listens to you and make sure that they follow your direction. Uh, but if, like I have, I give them somewhat of a long leash because they're gonna ask those questions that I don't know to ask. They're gonna press those issues that I might not realize are the ones that, no, I need an answer for this. You haven't gotten back to me on this. Wait, you know, where? And so I've given that authority a little bit, but then everything gets checked back to me. The great thing was the timeline. One of the things that I've heard about why other organizations uh, have had a little issue with the state program is it just is dragging out, it's taking forever is the fact that we knew right out of the gate that we were going for this November referendum. So a year ago, we were counting backwards from this November's referendum, and everything had to get done in that amount of time, period. We were not pushing forward past that, and the ESCO made it work. So that worked for us, and I, I was dedicated whenever the meetings need to be done, phone calls, emails, we got it done. Uh, the elected officials, I made sure they were very understanding of the project, aware of the project, there was some questions at first whether we should do it again because we just, we just tried to do it a couple years before uh, in a failed at referendum. But uh, the reason why we selected the ESCO that we did and the reason why the, the council is on board and I think that one of the reasons why we're successful, especially with the help of our Clean Energy Committee and our chairwoman, uh, Melissa Everett here, so thank you, um, is the resident understanding of the project and getting that word out there, getting the community to understand what it is and that it pays for itself. Um, Technically, I guess by election law, I can't be advocating for it since it's already on the referendum, but it pays for itself, so. Um, and then if anybody needs the link, here's the link to the Lead by Example website that the state is. All the resources are on there, all the ESCOs are on there, all the recommended documents that you use are on there. It's a great one-page resource for all the links, everything that they're doing. Uh, they really want you to use their resources, uh, and they've actually been a great help. Andy Bridges was, uh, Supposed to be here, but he couldn't today, so that's fine. But Andy Bridges was a great resource at the Green Bank, and so um, I really appreciate uh, their help. But that is it. Thank you.